Stay calm, you shall be ushered by our security officers in vacating the library to the designated evacuation area. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us acknowledge the presence of the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, His Excellency Enrique A. Manalo. You may now take your seats. Good morning, everybody. Today is a happy day for the Foreign Service Institute as we welcome everyone to the launching of the Ambassadors' Lecture Series, a platform that the Foreign Service Institute is opening specifically for heads of diplomatic missions in Manila to share their knowledge and expertise, experience, and advocacies. The Ambassador's Lecture Series aims to build stronger bridges of understanding, and that this understanding will lead us to insights, actions, and appreciation of relations, and encourage us to continue achieving our shared goals of cooperation, economic development, and peace. To officially launch the Ambassador's Lecture Series, it is my honor to call on stage the Secretary for Foreign Affairs and Chairperson of the Board of Foreign Service Institute, His Excellency Enrique A. Manalo, to deliver his remarks. His Excellency David Hartman, Ambassador of Canada to the Philippines, FSI Director General Noel Fernandez, esteemed members of the Diplomatic Corps, colleagues in government, friends and partners from the Academ, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my honor to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of the Ambassador's Lecture Series, featuring the Ambassador from Canada, David Hartman, who will speak on the topic, Building Bridges Across the Indo-Pacific, 
reflecting on 75 years of Canada-Philippines diplomacy. We are grateful to Ambassador Hartman for accepting FSI's invitation as we delve into the rich history and promising future of our bilateral relations. Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, which was unveiled in November of 2022, underscores Canada's commitment to the region's growth and stability. And we welcome Canada's emphasis on enhancing partnerships, especially with the Philippines and ASEAN. Last May, I had the pleasure of meeting Canadian Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie, whose visit to Manila highlighted the important role the Philippines plays in Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. We also discussed how the Philippines and Canada can work together in promoting the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific and strengthening ASEAN centrality, and also to promoting the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific as well as the regional architecture. Minister Jolie and I also had another opportunity to reaffirm our mutual commitment to deepening Philippine-Canada cooperation, both bilaterally and regionally, as well as in multilateral areas, when we met on the sidelines of the APEC meetings in San Francisco last week. Canada's support is evident through a myriad of programs, funding initiatives, and tangible efforts dedicated to upholding the rules-based international order. Noteworthy developments, such as the establishment of the ASEAN-Canada Strategic Partnership and Canada's opening of a visa processing center in Manila, are paving the way towards a more meaningful and impactful collaboration, especially in face of the complex challenges confronting our region as well as our respective countries. The Philippines deeply values Canada's commitment, both in words and actions, which reinforces the enduring bond between our two nations. I'm also pleased to note that Ambassador Hartman's chosen topic this morning will touch upon the Foreign Service Institute's six priority research areas for next year. The lecture series sets the stage for our collective exploration of how these critical themes fostering a deeper understanding of the realities and help shape our world as we look forward to the 75th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the Philippines and Canada in 2024. I also wish to commend the Foreign Service Institute for organizing the Ambassador's Lecture Series, which enables the heads of diplomatic missions in Manila to share their perspectives, insights, and advocacies. This platform holds great potential in fostering nuanced understanding of international issues and also global affairs, as well as forging stronger bridges of cooperation, peace, and prosperity. And as we prepare to mark the FSI's 50th founding anniversary in 2026, I encourage all of you to support actively its initiatives and take full advantage of the learning and networking opportunities it offers. Your active participation will undoubtedly contribute to FSI's continued success. I wish you all a fruitful discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for your encouraging words. At this point, we will have a photo opportunity. We invite His Excellency Secretary Manalo to stay in front to be joined by our speaker today, Ambassador David Hartman of the Embassy of Canada in the Philippines, and the Foreign Service Institute's Assistant Secretary, Francisco Noel R. Fernandez III. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for your time. It is my honor now to introduce the first lecturer of the Ambassador's Lecture Series. Our lecturer was recently Director General of the South Asia Bureau at Global Affairs Canada, 
where he was responsible for the oversight of Canada's international relations with seven countries. He was born in Ottawa, Ontario. He graduated from Queen's University with a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in History and Politics and later obtained a Master of Arts in Diplomatic History from the University of Ottawa. He's also a graduate of the Public Sector Leadership and Governance Program from the University of Ottawa and University of Oxford's Advanced Management and Leadership Program. He was previously Executive Director of the Greater China Division, Acting Director General and Director of the Invest in Canada Bureau, and Director of one of the Trade Commissioner Services Business Sectors Divisions, where he was responsible for the Aerospace and Defense automotive and information and communication technologies industries. Before beginning his career with the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in 1998, our speaker worked as a special assistant to a member of parliament in Canada's House of Commons. Throughout his career, he has developed broad-based and proven experience in international affairs, international business, national security, and the development of strategic approaches to the management of key bilateral relationships with some of Canada's most challenging and complex diplomatic partners, including China and India. To share his thoughts on his chosen topic, Building Bridges Across the Indo-Pacific, reflecting on 75 years of Canada-Philippines diplomacy, may call on stage the inaugural lecture of the Ambassador's Lecture Series from the Embassy of Canada in the Philippines, Ambassador David Hartman. Sir. Magadang umanga sa inyo lahat. Bonjour, everyone, and good morning to you all. I'd like to thank, first off, Secretary Manalo for taking the time out of a charge agenda to, you know, to initiate today's discussion. I'm very, very grateful for that. Foreign Service Institute Director General and Assistant Secretary Francisco Noel Fernandez III, my friend, friends and colleagues from the diplomatic community, it is indeed my great pleasure and a tremendous personal honor to be here today with you and with colleagues from across the Department of Foreign Affairs to deliver the inaugural Ambassador's Lecture Series presentation. Thank you. I am also especially proud this morning to share with you some of the reflections of the state of Canada-Philippine bilateral relations and the tremendously positive trajectory and momentum for our future relationship. Indeed, I consider myself to be especially fortunate to be representing Canada here at this auspicious moment in the evolution of Canada-Philippine relations. When she visited Manila in earlier this year in May, Canadian Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie emphasized to President Marcos that now is the time for ambition in the Canada-Philippines relationship. In direct response, the President stated, then let's get to work. And ladies and gentlemen, I could not agree more. Next year, our two countries will celebrate 75 years of the establishment of our diplomatic relations, a significant and important milestone by any measure. Indeed, from the Canadian perspective, we have been building our bilateral relationship with the Philippines for just under half of our history as an independent country. Conversely, from the Philippine perspective, it was just two short years after achieving independence from the United States that Canada established its first formal diplomatic representation here in Manila. While our bilateral history is not as long, nor perhaps quite as storied as that which exists between the Philippines and Spain or the Philippines and the United States, I do firmly believe that our shared history is unique and worthy of great pride and celebration. Consider, for example, that both of our countries began their modern histories as colonies of great powers. Both of our countries have, since independence, built vibrant and dynamic democracies. Both of our countries, as middle powers, have contributed to the establishment and maintenance of the rules-based international order put in place in the wake of the Second World War. Both of our countries have sought, through the expansion of a rules-based international trading system, to create opportunities and prosperities for our peoples. Both of our countries have felt firsthand the impact of climate change and have committed together to, to the fight against it. Both of our countries are maritime nations, committed to the sustainable and responsible exploration of maritime resources and the preservation of fragile marine ecosystems. Both countries have and continue to grapple with the impact of extreme weather events, natural disasters, and the other environmental crises that have come at great cost to our countries and to our peoples. And both of our countries recognize the vital importance of engaging the wider world 
as component parts of an integrated global economy to create opportunity and prosperity for our peoples. All of the aforementioned examples are clear and they are long-standing interests and they have been and continue to be built and developed on a robust foundation of extensive people-to-people -people ties between our two great countries. By our best reckoning, the first Filipino immigrant to Canada arrived on our shores in 1861, a young man named Benson Flores, who lived his lifetime as a fisherman and trapper on Bowen Island in British Columbia on Canada's beautiful Pacific coast. Today, 162 years after Mr. Flores first arrived in Canada, one out of every 40 residents of our country claim Filipino heritage, a community of one million strong. Canadians are tremendously proud of the fact that the Philippines is the second source country for new immigrants to Canada and a top three source of foreign students studying in Canada. Wherever I travel in the Philippines, I am hard pressed to find a Filipino who does not have a close friend or a close family member somewhere in Canada. Indeed, Filipinos have become an integral part of Canada's multicultural mosaic, living in regions across the vast expanse of our great country, from the high Arctic to the centers of our largest cities, from coast to coast to coast, in every province and in every territory of Canada. But this is not a one-way relationship. When, COVID pan when the COVID pandemic finally lifted here in the Philippines, the first flight carrying foreign tourists to this beautiful country came from Canada. So far this calendar year, almost 200,000 Canadian citizens have visited the Philippines. Canada is proud to be a top 10 trade and investment partner for the Philippines, a relationship that is growing by leaps and bounds. Canada is proud to be a world leader in products and technologies vital to the Philippine economy, including in the agri-food sector, in education, climate finance, infrastructure, telecommunications, clean technologies, nuclear energy, information and communications technologies, the creative industries, mining, aerospace, and defense and security. Canada and the Philippines are truly like-minded and have numerous common interests and objectives. We are both committed multilateralists dedicated to upholding a rules-based international order. We are trading economies for whom prosperity and opportunity for our peoples is predicated on access to global markets. Both of our countries are counted amongst the most affected by climate change. We share a common commitment to the safe, sustainable, and responsible management of our res respective vast maritime domains. We share a commitment to open liberal democracy, and we both have experienced firsthand, sadly, the efforts of malign actors to subvert and corrupt our democratic institutions. We share a common commitment to upholding and defending fundamental human rights and human dignity. We also share an important conviction that attacks on the rules-based international order must be confronted, that acts of coercion and intimidation must be answered, and that misinformation and disinformation must be called out. For all of the aforementioned reasons and more, Canada and the Philippines are natural and long-standing partners. It is not surprising, therefore, that when Canada announced our Indo-Pacific strategy on the 30th of November last year, almost one year ago to the day, that the Philippines was to be found at the very forefront of our national strategy. Priority in this context is not a word we use lightly. Over the past 12 months, my team and I at the Embassy of Canada have worked hard to translate our vision to the, for the Philippines-Canada relationship into concrete reality. Of course, actions, as they say, speak louder than words. And I'm very proud today to reflect with you on how Canada has invested in its relationship with the Philippines. We have increased our engagements by our Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers with their Filipino counterparts, including as recently as Secretary Manalo has suggested last week at the APEC Summit in San Francisco. We have worked together with the Philippines at the United Nations, in ASEAN, and bilaterally to uphold and reinforce the rules-based international order. This has included supporting each other in the advancement of UN resolutions on major global issues, including Russia's illegal and unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing crisis in Myanmar, and most recently, the conflict in Israel and Gaza. We have supported each other for key candidacies in multilateral institutions. We have been clear, consistent, and vocal in our con condemnation of acts of coercion by the People's Republic of China in the West Philippine Sea, and our support for the 2016 Arbitral Award. We have enhanced our diplomatic presence here at our Embassy in Manila by adding new staff and new personnel to our Embassy team across our political, trade, defence, law enforcement, immigration and consular teams in order to give us the human capital, the human resources necessary to pursue our ambitious program of cooperation with the Philippines. 
we held the inaugural meeting of the Canada-Philippines Joint Economic Commission to deepen cooperation on clean energy transition, including in nuclear energy, critical minerals, food security, education, again, the creative industries, and the pursuit of opportunities in science, technology, and innovation. We opened a new global processing center in Manila to reduce visa processing times. We introduced the electronic travel authorization program, allowing hundreds of thousands of Filipinos to secure travel documents online in just minutes, and facilitating the future travel of millions of additional eligible Filipino citizens to travel to Canada for business, to visit family, or simply to enjoy the vast natural beauty and expanse that Canada has to offer. We launched the CanWorks Philippines Initiative to streamline work permit processing for Filipino workers seeking employment opportunities across Canada. We have partnered with Filipino civil society organizations to promote sustainable fisheries, to preserve marine ecosystems, to combat misinformation and disinformation, to support peace building in the BARM, and to uphold and defend human rights, and as I mentioned previously, most importantly, human dignity. We have increased our defense cooperation, including through the collaborative sales between Royal Canadian Navy ships and the Philippine Navy, and our participation in joint and multilateral military exercises. And just this week, we have deployed Canada's Dark Vessel Detection Program, a satellite-based maritime domain monitoring system to enhance Philippine maritime domain awareness and reinforce Philippine efforts to maintain maritime safety and security, protect fragile marine ecosystems, and combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in Philippine territorial waters. We have held five rounds of negotiations of a Canada-ASEAN free trade agreement intended to improve market access, boost trade and investment, and reinforce the rules-based trading system. And I am very proud to say that there is actually much more to come. Just last month in October, I had the privilege of attending the sixth annual Canada-Philippines Commission on Bilateral Cooperation, which was held back in our capital in Ottawa. There, our respective delegations held substantive exchanges on our shared challenges and priorities. And moreover, we worked together successfully to chart out an ambitious plan to expand and intensify our collaboration over the year ahead. This will include expanding our exchanges on cyber defense and cybersecurity and identifying opportunities to work together to strengthen Filipino capacities to respond to escalating cyber threats. Focused dialogue between relevant specialists on the battle against malign influence foreign interference and economic coercion, as well as how we can work together to safeguard our democratic institutions and protect our economic foundations. New investments in disaster risk reduction, resilient communities, and the battle against climate change. New investments in our long-standing work together with Philippine civil society to uphold, to promote, and to defend fundamental human rights, human dignity, and the freedom of expression. The holding in Manila of the inaugural Canada-Philippines Maritime Dialogue to bring focus to our rapidly expanding cooperation in marine safety and security, protection of merit, uh, maritime ecosystems, and our joint efforts to combat illegal and uh, unreported and unregulated fishing. Collaborative work to reinforce and uphold the rules-based international order and international law, both here in the Indo-Pacific and together around the world. We will work together closely to pursue expanded cooperation to address shared challenges, particularly here in the Philippines, like food security, energy security, and the integrity of our capital supply chains. We will work to boost uh, trade and investment. We will bring an integrated Team Canada trade mission to the Philippines in 2024 to connect essential government and business stakeholders and to create opportunities for our Canadian and Filipino business communities. We will continue to expand our defense and military cooperation and ensure that world-class Canadian technologies and capabilities are on offer to the armed forces of the Philippines, the Philippine Coast Guard, and other security stakeholders as they accelerate their modernization and force deployment plans. And we will welcome President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. on a state visit to Ottawa and other cities across Canada in the interest of deepening our ties at the very highest level to prioritize our work together and to chart an ambitious way forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the ambition and commitment I see on both sides of the Pacific to capitalize on the opportunity before us is both clear and it is compelling. It is the product of 74 years of sustained collaborative cooperation underpinned by robust people-to-people -people ties and built on a foundation of shared interest, values, and mutual respect. The Canada-Philippines relationship is one that has withstood all manners of shocks and disruptions, and it has not only endured, it has thrived. As I stand before you here today, upon the cusp of 2024 and the 75th anniversary of the establishment of our diplomatic relations, taking full account of the instability and uncertainty that has come to characterize the 21st century, 
as malign powers exert great effort to upend and overturn the very foundations of the international order that has served as the basis of our mutual security and prosperity since 1945, I take tremendous confidence in the temperance, the probity, and the mutual respect that has characterized the partnership between our two great countries. The investments we have made in each other, the trust we have built with each other, and the understanding that we have fostered between our peoples has positioned us well to respond together to the challenges of our age. The link that binds us represents a vast bridge that spans the breadth of the Pacific, a conduit for the free exchange of ideas, investment, goods, culture, art, knowledge, and labor that has made us ideal partners. Friends, I am excited by the prospect of a year ahead, and I'm very excited for what it will bring. I am daunted by the sheer scale of the opportunity that stands before us, and I am humbled by the opportunity to build on the work of those who have come before us to help write the next chapter in the great Canada-Philippines relationship. Maraming salamat po, merci beaucoup, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hartman, for allowing us to view Canada-Philippines relations from your point of view and really showing us the breadth and depth of the, this strong partnership. Your lecture definitely gave us a deeper appreciation of the various programs and activities that both our countries pursue, especially in maintaining peace and order in the seas and keeping people-to-people -people engagements robust. So there have been a number of... Uh, takeaways for me, like C is for Canada, right. and some of our efforts are on C, cybersecurity, and also climate change. But um, one of the parts of, one part of your message, um, which I'm very happy to hear about, is that um, Canada being clear, consistent, and vocal in your condemnation of acts of coercion by the People's Republic of China in the West Philippine Sea, and your full support for the 2016 Arbitral Award. That's a lot of C's in one sentence. So now our forum is opening the floor for some of your comments and questions. So kindly please um, state your name first, introduce yourself and your aff affiliation or organization before mentioning your comment or question. So we have some time. We have, uh, of course, our guest from the Diplomatic Corps, we have from the academe, from the DFA, and also the institute and the media. Don't be shy. Okay. So maybe while waiting for the first question, one C I remember now is for the our caring workers that also support, of course, your. Um, healthcare industry, and maybe you can just uh, give us some of your insights um, being post pandemic on how our Filipino uh, workers, especially our nurses, uh, have helped uh, Canada. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the question. And I think, you know, for many of us uh, and those of you in the audience today, uh, from the members of the diplomatic community, um, you know, the Philippines has a remarkably strong and storied tradition of. Uh, is sharing your deep humanity with the global community. And one of the ways that, that typically manifests itself most poignantly is in the area of healthcare. And Canada, like many countries around the world, have benefited tremendously um, from Filipino healthcare workers, uh, particularly nurse, uh, nurses, uh, throughout our country. And we are in the midst of working very collaboratively. Um, in Canada, healthcare is a subnational responsibility, it's a provincial responsibility. Um, and uh, over the, the first year of my uh, tenure here, we have had many, many delegations from Canada led by provincial premiers and, and senior officials coming to, to want to prospect, uh, to, to take advantage of some of the opportunity uh, that exists to provide employment opportunities in Canada for Filipino healthcare workers. But we want to do this in a reciprocal way. We are very sensitive and understanding of the fact that there are challenges and, and labor shortages, ironically, even in the field here. So we're working with our partners to try and develop um, you know, cooperative uh, programs together where there may be opportunities to endow and provide scholarships in the healthcare system here, in the education system, in the schools of nursing, et cetera, to have one stream uh, to facilitate the ability, ability of Filipino uh, healthcare workers to, to come to Canada and other markets around the world, but also to develop the opportunity 
opportunity to expand the point of presence here in the Philippines. So we really do want to be able to engage in this area, uh, which is very important for Canada, um, on a collaborative basis. We really do want it to be reciprocal, and we do tr you know, truly want it to be a win-win. So that's very strong messaging that the government of Canada has been providing to our partners and stakeholders in Canada. It's one that has had tremendous resonance. Um, and we'll continue to look forward to, you know, further developing those opportunities, uh, certainly in the year and in the years ahead. Thank you, sir. Yes, please. Good morning, Ambassador. Good morning. Edwin Estrada from the Foreign Service Institute, and welcome to our uh, humble abode. Um, one of the things that you've mentioned where in the Philippines and Canada would want to cooperate on would be on cyber threats. Mm -hmm. um, in research, in our uh, research division, we are trying to focus uh, on, on artificial intelligence and uh, that would be in connection with uh, cyber security issues. Um, I was wondering, Ambassador, if you can give us um, a bit more details on, uh, on what kinds of cyber threats would we want to focus on when it comes to Philippines-Canada relations? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. And I mean, candidly, it's not necessarily for Canada to determine for the Philippines what the threats are. Uh, that's the independent autonomous uh, assessment of the government of the Philippines. But what I will say is we are remarkably proud of the fact that we do truly have a world-class uh, cyber industry writ large, the entire ecosystem. So both, um, you know, Canada is very uh, proud, uh, both through our civil society, our academic institutions, and our very strong and robust private sector uh, to bring considerable capacity to bear. Uh, Canada, as I think you, will, uh, everyone will know all too well, is a member of the Five Eyes um, Intelligence uh, Partnership. Um, so we have uh, world-class capacity uh, from a cyber defense uh, perspective. So we are fully prepared to bring the full scale and scope of, of our skills and our knowledge and our know-how uh, to share with the people of the Philippines um, and with the government of the Philippines, but candidly not just with government, but equally importantly with, the, with civil society, with the private sector, um, because it is at, at some of those levels. And, it, and it's not just state to state and all of these other entities. It's cyber crime. It's, it's really the whole comprehensive uh, portfolio of threats, and of course, the reality is, uh, we see those threats manifesting themselves, you know, on a daily basis. So, we will begin uh, in early January of next year. We will be hosting a significant Cyber Week here in the Philippines. We will be bringing over the head of our uh, Cybersecurity Center, um, who is a, a good friend of mine and who I've worked with uh, uh, for many, many uh, years in the past. And so, we will put together an entire program. We will have. Um, a series of lectures, uh, lectures here uh, and, re and meet with a wide range of stakeholders. So we, we do intend it to be very comprehensive, but I want to be very clear that, you know, we will cue on our partners and our friends' demands, right? So as the government of the Philippines in particular assesses, you know, where the greatest needs are, those will be the areas where we will want to respond first. But we are proud to say that we do have that robust capacity. And Canada also, I think we're very proud that of the fact that we are one of the top leaders in AI in the world. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly top five, if not top three, in terms of the amount of research and development uh, funds from a public uh, perspective that we channel into uh, work on artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and again, so we've got that robust program of collaboration and history of collaboration between uh, government and the private sector to make sure that uh, we have a, a very, very robust ecosystem and very, very happy. We'll be very pleased to be able to, um, to share that here in the Philippines. Thank you, sir. Yes, please. Good morning, Ambassador. Thank you for your um, lecture for us this morning. I am V from the Foreign Service Institute, one of the researchers. I have two questions, if I may. Uh, first is, um, in your Indo-Pacific strategy, Canada has um, expressed this desire to um, if I, if I may quote, to recognize and support ASEAN centrality in the region, including the reinforcing alignment between Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. In, um, in, your, in your perspective, how is Canada implementing this? So how is Canada, rather, planning to implement this sort of alignment between the AOIP and the Canada Indo-Pacific strategy? And my second question will be on the perceived, perceived great power rivalry, which I think you also recognized in your 
Indo-Pacific strategy, and you've said as, as a middle power, if I may ask, as a middle power, how are you responding to this great power, power rivalry, and um, what do you think are the challenges that comes with it? Thank you so much. Thank you. Those are very robust questions. I think I'll, I'll start with the latter. Um, you know, look, Canada, our, 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 our Prime Minister Trudeau I, our current Prime Minister's father, you know, was one of the very first Canadian uh, politicians to articulate, you know, in the context of great powers. Uh, for Canada, we're like a mouse sleeping next to an elephant, right, living next to an elephant in our relationship with the United States. And so I think what's very important for Canada in that sort of that broad context, and as a middle power, uh, we've always had, I think, a, a sense of uh, committed responsibility to the multilateral rural space system. I'll be very candid. I mean, Canada is blessed to be prosperous, uh, but we, our prosperity is based on our ability to trade, right? So from a realpolitik, uh, national self-interest perspective, um, in order for us to be able to sustain many of the, uh, the benefits and the privileges that Canadians have come to, uh, to cherish, our, our, our national health care system, our, our social safety net, we must trade with the world. One out of every six jobs in Canada is tied to international trade. So international business can only succeed and flourish when uh, the rules, the norms, the standards are clear, transparent, and predictable. Uh, so I think clearly it's in our, it, I mean, we are here, we engage for all of those reasons, for altruistic reasons, for philosophical principles, for our values, but we also do it for, you know, for, for national interest, right, from a, a realpolitik perspective. And so uh, what's very important in the messaging that we're sending, to, particularly to our friends and partners here in the Philippines, but to all of our partners throughout the, throughout the world, candidly, but also within the Indo-Pacific uh, Indo and, and here within ASEAN, is that, um, you know, the international community, all of those, you know, like-minded liberal democracies who cherish democracy, who cherish rule of law, who cherish, you know, human rights, you know, it is not just a dialectic, if I may be so bold, between Washington and Beijing, right? It's not just those great power politics, but the rest of the committed international community, the multilateralists, stand in unity and in unison with the Philippines, right? We must work together. We must reinforce one another's efforts so that it's not a polarized discussion. Sadly, the world has become so polarized. We see in our own societies the political debate, the political dialectic. I mean, it has become um, unhealthy. So, you know, as a middle power, right? For us, it's all well about reasonableness. Our litmus test is ultimately about the reasonableness. How reasonable are the approaches being taken? And how can we find that reasonable accommodation? In Canada, it's something that's built into our DNA. Uh, our two you know, founding nations outside of our ind indigenous populations, the English and the French, right? It was about finding reasonable uh, accommodation between English and French. It was about finding reasonable accommodation between Catholic and Protestant. And then now as a very, you know, one of the world's largest multicultural uh, countries in the world, it's all about finding that reasonable. So, so again, in terms of the great power politics, it's about finding that common ground, um, you know, so that we can all work forward to, to all of these, uh, you know, values and institutions that candidly, all of us who signed on to, to, to many of these agreements and these accords as, as, you know, as, as members of the United Nations, right? These are all agreements and principles to which we have collectively ascribed. These are not us imposing. The, we, we've, agree, we've agreed to these rules and principles. Now, like anything in life, things need to be kept evergreen. They need to evolve. They need to uh, keep apropos and, 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 and keep you know, organically growing. And we will continue to work to, you know, through all the various multilateral mechanisms to make sure that they reflect the needs of the growing international community, right? Canada was instrumental in establishing the G20, right? As a member of the G7, we, we knew we needed to, go, you know, to grow and reflect. I mean, it was at the time our, our Minister of Finance and then our, our Prime Minister, Paul Martin, who was really quite instrumental in getting that group set up. So we, we want to do it in, in, in common uh, with the global community. We know that there are differences between the, you know, I, I'm not so fond of the terms, but global north, global south, but, you know, these various constituencies. And rather than having the world become increasingly fractured, we want to find the things that bind us together, the values that we share, the interests that we share. Uh, I mean, look, let's be honest, in the end, everybody loves their children, right? Everybody wants what's best for their family. And so that's where we need to find that common ground again. Um, in, in terms of, you know, what we want to do here a little bit more in merging our own interest, you know, with uh, our Indo-Pacific strategy and, you know, the vision and the notion of centrality in ASEAN, the reality is, you know, the, the Indo-Pacific and ASEAN in particular is increasingly becoming the center of future global economic growth. You know, by 2030, almost 40% of global GDP will come from this region of the world. The largest, um, you know, base of growing middle class, et cetera. 
And so, you know, just a few short months ago, Canada um, was proud and, and, and very privileged to become a strategic partner of ASEAN. So we want to make sure that our own interests are, are aligned, right? And that in some effect, I mean, it, it may be a, a bit of um, um, reinforcement, right? So that many of the messages, many of the street, same strategic objectives that we share are, are, are reinforced, right? They're not mutually exclusive, you know, quite the contrary. So we're trying to find that, again, that common ground uh, to make sure that, you know, an articulation of what has been already um, put forward by ASEAN and many of our other partners in the region. Look, Canada, I'll be very candid, as an Indo-Pacific nation, we were a little bit late in terms of articulating what our Indo-Pacific strategy was, but we wanted to be very thoughtful about it. We wanted to be very articulate about it, right? We, we have three oceans, the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Pacific, right? So we wanted to make sure that we took our time, that we thought things through. But I think what we're most important, uh, proud of, rather, and what I would argue as, a, as, a, as an official, what is most uh, reassuring is that our government actually committed money to our strategy. Um, it's, we have a generational endeavor, it's a 10-year uh, program, but for the first five years at least, our government has committed billions of dollars uh, to, to literally putting our you know, money where our mouth is, right? So that it's not just rhetoric, that it's not just, um, you know, uh, words, if I may be so bold, but that, you know, we actually have concrete deliverables to be able to achieve. And, you know, at some level, uh, being Canadian, I'll be somewhat self-deprecating and apologize somewhat for my long laundry list, right? But these are the very concrete things that we've been able to achieve in very short order. And as a civil servant, right, and as a bureaucrat, I can tell you some of the things that we've been able to achieve, even within the span of one calendar year, we're, I'm really proud of, and I'm very proud of my colleagues from, and our team at the embassy who have worked uh, tenaciously, assiduously, to make sure that we are able to deliver on a lot of what we had promised. And um, that's not something, candidly, that happens all the time in the world of diplomacy, as many of my colleagues here today will know. Uh, so that is something that I think is, uh, is quite precious and something that we want to continue to, to nurture and invest in. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, Excellency. Um, congratulations for the uh, very informative uh, presentation this morning. Thank you. Um, indeed, uh, Canada-Philippine relations have gone a long way um, uh, 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 since uh, it was established, 75, uh, since diplomatic relations between the two countries have been established 75 years ago. In fact, uh, Philippines and Canada, uh, Canada is now the 20th largest um, trading partner of the Philippines. It is the 17th largest export market of the Philippines, and it is the 20th largest uh, importer uh, of goods to the Philippines. Um, in terms of tourism, uh, just like any other country, um, we, uh, for the past uh, 10 years, the Philippines has seen an increasing number of Can Canadian tourists, mm -hmm except in 2020 and 2021 due to the onslaught of the pandemic. But in 2022, I'm happy to note that there has been a rebound. Um, Canadian tourists have started again uh, coming to the Philippines. However, Mr. Uh, Amba Your Excellency Ambassador, um, I note with concern the decline of Canadian investments in the Philippines since 2014. In fact, since 2014, for the past 10 years, Canada has been divesting more money than it has been investing in the Philippines. So my question, Mr. Ambassador, is um, what are the reasons um, that Canadian businessmen, Canadian businessmen have expressed to you or to, to your colleagues or to, the, to, to whoever the reasons why they are pulling out their investments for the past 10 years. Although it may be noted that there are Canadian investors still in, in coming, but more money is coming out and more land money is coming in. Yeah. Number two, Mr. Ambassador, for, uh, you, have been, uh, you have told us uh, about your thrusts to uh, improve trade and investment. So what are the plans of the Canadian Embassy to promote the Philippines as the number one destination for investments uh, in the world? And I can probably say that, yes, indeed, it is true. Um, we, the Philippine government through the DFA has been promoting the Philippines as, as a, the one of the best tourist, um, 
one of the best investment destinations now. Mm -hmm. So those are the two questions, Mr. Yeah. Ambassador. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So I, I think on the first, I think some of the metrics that you cited about the, uh, the scale and the scope and where we rank in terms of our bilateral commercial relationship, none of those numbers, none of those objectives are good enough. Uh, and we will work very tenaciously to make sure that we increase those. Um, I think there is a lot of good to come. You know, you talked about some measure of divestment. A lot of that had to do with, I think, uh, supply chains. I think a lot of it had to do with strategic opportunities elsewhere in the region. Uh, gee, even in the, my tenure in my last assignment as Director General for South Asia, um, you know, Canada has, our, our public pension funds are, in fact, the largest institutional investors in the world. We have over a trillion U.S. dollars invested in global capital markets around the world. And so um, those public pension funds, those big stakeholders in Canada are very, very interested uh, in the opportunity that exists here. Uh, the Marcos administration over the course of the last year have been very, very um, proactive in opening up your country uh, and welcoming foreign investment. That has tremendously caught the attention uh, of the Canadian business community. And I think you will be very, very pleasant surprised with the scale and the scope of that investment that will be forthcoming into the country from Canada. They see the opportunities in infrastructure. They see the opportunity in public-private partnerships, an area in which Canada, again, I'm very proud to say, has tremendous subject matter expertise. So I think, you know, some of that divestment was as a result of global uh, trends that we saw around the world. Uh, Canada was um, having a lot of investment going into South Asia in particular, lots of economic opportunity there. But again, as a prosperous country, our, our objective will be to build back um, you know, that investment. And a lot of it, candidly, has resulted from the messaging that's being sent by the government of the Philippines to the global investment community. Uh, that your country is open for business, that you are um, desirous, that you are now removing restrictions to foreign direct investment in the country by opening up sectors of the economy to 100% uh, foreign investment. And I would dare say that Canada is the type, uh, and our companies are the type that we want to have here. Ones that respect law, ones that are open, transparent, have fiduciary responsibility, publicly traded, and truly private sector companies that will bring wealth and prosperity to the Philippines. We also uphold uh, you know, the strictest corporate social responsibilities um, you know, guidelines in the world. If a Canadian firm were to come here and engage in activity that was untowards, not only would they be subject uh, to discipline by the government of the Philippines, they would be subject to discipline at home, including you know, prosecution if necessary. So there are certain sectors here where we have very, very large, uh, the, the insurance industry, uh, the largest insurance firms in the country, Manulife and um, Sun Life, are Canadian companies. They've been here for over 100 years. Our telecommunication company, TELUS, is very large here. Uh, ICT companies, open techs, et cetera. Um, and I think you'll see a lot more come here, particularly in the small and medium-sized sector, in the agri-food sector in particular. Uh, Canada is blessed to have an abundance, I think, of what this country needs, energy security and food security, um, and clean energy, and the appropriate food to, to adapt to the local marketplace. So I, I, your, your, your question on noted of, on some measure of divestment, um, I'm very, very confident uh, that any of those trends um, will be fulsomely reversed, particularly by the policy approaches the, the regulatory environment that I think the government of the Philippines is uh, put, putting forward, is implementing, uh, by the engagement, I think, of uh, legislators here in both Congress and Senate of wanting to make sure that uh, foreign capital uh, flows into this country. And the Marcos administration could not be any more explicitly clear on how welcome that investment is. You know, the, the governor of the central bank, the minister, uh, secretary of finance were in Toronto in our financial capital uh, in July. Um, on an investment roadshow. That messaging has uh, already borne fruit. And uh, over the coming months, you will see many, many, many uh, senior business delegations coming here, including a, a Team Canada trade mission that will be led by our Minister of International Trade. Uh, we're still trying to determine the exact timeframes. Uh, we have an awful lot going on in 2024, so we're trying to deconflict. It's becoming a, a logistical operation. Uh, but we will, I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised uh, by the scale and scope of investment that will come here, um, including in your critical mineral sector, right? Canada is currently the largest investor in your mining sector. I think it's very important, uh, you know, to, to acknowledge that there cannot be a clean energy transition without critical minerals, right? Critical minerals are absolutely essential uh, to the development of the, of the clean energy transition and all the various technologies. And the Philippines, your country, is blessed with an abundance of those critical minerals. You are the fifth most mineralized country on earth. 
that has not gone unnoticed. So there's a natural partnership between Canada and the Philippines there. The global capital market, the global stock exchange to raise capital for the extractive industries is the Toronto Stock Exchange. The, the world's largest you know, um, extractive uh, industry show, the PDAC, the Professional Developers uh, Association of Canada show is held in March every year. So we will see uh, senior level delegations uh, from the Philippines coming to Canada. Uh, we are very hopeful that we will have a, Canada, a Philippine delegation um, in, in March of next year. Etc. So again, as I as I mentioned, you know, in my um, my my comments this morning, um, from A to Z and everything in between, the entire scale and scope of opportunity here um, is quite daunting, it, it, and daunting in a good way, right? It's a good problem to have, uh, and as my colleagues at the embassy are uh, very um, uh, remind me that this relationship, the, the the significant uptick and reinvestment in this relationship, that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, so that we have to take our time, we have to pace ourselves. And it's very something that's very important here that, you know, as the Philippines is opening itself up, you know, the entire international community is interested in the opportunities, right? But the complementarities between our respective economies are very strong. Um, but we want to be able to provide solutions and come and engage in relationships where there is the appropriate absorptive capacity, right? We don't want to, you can say, I'm a little bit thirsty. We don't want to turn on a fire hose and say, well, here we are, right? We want to do it in a manner uh, that the, our, 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 our hosts are able to absorb, right? So we want to tailor our approach here in a manner that is desired uh, by the government of the Philippines, by the Philippine business community, et cetera. So we will work very, um, in a very focused way over the coming months and years to make sure that we are uh, driving forward in that direction. Thank you, sir. Maybe we can have the last question or comment, please. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, going back to the issue of the people-to-people -people contacts, yeah. uh, and you, men you mentioned that the one out of 40 uh, people in Canada would be a Philippine origin. Yeah. Are we, uh, is the Filipino uh, diaspora in Canada uh, uh, possibly the second or third largest of all foreign communities in Canada? And also just a comment that uh, uh, most of us are aware of the large presence of Filipinos in places like Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, but they're all over Canada, including, oh. I understand, in some very northern areas where it's very cold, and yes. yet Filipinos yes. are resilient yeah. and live there and uh, contribute to the Canadian uh, economy and way of life. So yes. uh, where is the Filipino community among foreign communities uh, in terms of uh, are we soon to be the possibly the largest or yeah yeah so, yeah. so uh thank you for the question i think you know as i said uh earlier you know canada is a remarkably multicultural uh society we remain one of the few countries in the world that is um very much welcoming uh to migration in fact last year canada took in a million immigrants um to tip us over the the 40 million mark. Uh, the Philippines is one of the, as I mentioned as well, one of the fastest growing uh, populations in Canada ethnically. You know, we have a phenomenon in Canada, we would just describe ourselves as a cultural mosaic. And when we compare and uh, contrast ourselves, as we often do in North America with the United States, you know, the United States is a melting pot. So Canada is a country where uh, people can come and very much retain their cultural heritage, their way of life, et cetera, and be very, very proud of that. And we're very proud of the fact that we, we do live together very uh, successfully in a lot of harmony. Um, you know, but we have a million Canadians now. Uh, again, to frame it in the North American context and to give, I think, people here an appreciation of the scale, the size, the scope, you know, one out of every 40 Canadians is a Filipino heritage. In the United States, it's one out of every 150 Americans, right? So Canada is much more Filipino than the U.S. is, right? So, uh, but it, and, and I say that a bit glibly and I say that a little bit in jest, but it is something that we are tremendously proud of. And I think that the, the point in your question is very well taken. Yes, of course, like many immigrant communities, uh, when Filipinos will come to Canada, they'll, they'll, they'll go to or migrate to our large urban centers. Uh, Canada has become an, a remarkably urbanized country. In fact, 85 plus percent of our population lives within, within 200 kilometers of the U.S. Uh, border, the 49th parallel. And of course, you know, uh, Canada is a massive landmass, a massive country, uh, second largest in the world. And so, but the point is very well taken. You know, my impression personally uh, it has been you know, the people of the Philippines are remarkably industrious, remarkably hardworking. Um, the, the significance of, I think, Filipinos coming to Canada, migrating to Canada um, as citizens and as permanent residents, and also as temporary workers, and the scale and the, the volume of remittances that those people send back to family here in the Philippines, it's billions of dollars a year. 
Um, but Filipinos go where the work is. So yes, your point was very well taken. Um, when I first arrived here, uh, I was with my family. We met a, we were, uh, as, as many new guests to the country, wanted to spend, uh, my children joined me back from Canada, uh, university age uh, students. We were in Barakai and uh, as you can tell, I like to talk. We were sitting in front of a, um, uh, we were in this, uh, you know, uh, diving supply shop, a snorkeling shop, and there was this young couple in front of us. And I went to introduce myself. I said, "Oh, hi. Where are you from? Oh, we're from Vancouver." I said, "Wow." I said, "I'm the new Canadian ambassador," and they said, "Well, you must meet our mother." I said, "Okay, sure." So uh, the mother, a Filipina woman, comes out, and she's a nurse practitioner. So she's a healthcare worker who, 15 years ago, left to go to Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, very close to, in the north of Canada, we have a very large diamond mining industry. And she moved up there to support a telemedicine program. So this is a very advanced healthcare professional who runs a very, very successful healthcare practice in the north. And uh, she, she assesses people for their health and vitality. And if they need further medical intervention, they'll fly them, this is not something Canada says, right, to the south, you know, into uh, a major city like um, Edmonton in the province of Alberta. And I said, let me get this straight. I said, you left this tropical paradise to move to the Canadian subarctic. It's not quite the Arctic, but it is just around the, the edge of the tree line, right? Where it becomes so cold, trees can no longer grow. And she said, yes, and I love it there. And I'm ensconced in this community. I, I come home for a month every year, um, and, but it's true. We meet people that are in our Atlantic provinces and in, in rural outports, we call them, in Newfoundland and Labrador uh, on the... Uh, uh, on, you know, really in the high uh, North Atlantic. And, it, and, it's, and it's incredible. And you hear these stories time and time again because people will go to where the jobs are. And because Filipinos are English speaking, their ability to, you know, uh, acculturate and get up to speed in Canadian society is, is very, is a quick one. And I think, and I'd like to think because Canadians generally are quite welcoming um, of that. So that, this, is a, this is an area where we continue to, to grow. And I think the Filipino experience for the most part, I think has been a remarkably positive one. And so uh, the Philippines is probably top five in Canada now uh, in terms of um, most recent immigrant uh, populations to Canada with that growing very rapidly since, well, from the 60s, uh, 1960s onward, but particularly through the 80s and the 90s and, and very much so uh, up to the present. Thank you very much for your active participation in our open forum. So as parting shot, Ambassador, maybe you can share about um, studying in Canada and yeah. also what we can, what can we look forward to celebrating the 75th um, anniversary of our relations yes. and uh, your final words of encouragement to yeah. the, our audience today. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think I've left you with enough uh, lists today of all the wonderful things we've done together and that we hope to do together. Um, but next year is a big year, right? A 75th anniversary, I think, as I mentioned, in any context is something very special and something very noteworthy. And we really do intend uh, to celebrate the relationship. I mean, we're looking into things as, um, uh, uh, that are as fun as, you know, minting coins from the Royal Canadian Mint to celebrate, uh, having uh, Canada Post issue postage stamps, you know, to acknowledge the Filipino-Canadian community, to acknowledge our relationship, the things that we've done together, the things that we will do together. So there's a tremendous opportunity looking forward. Canada, I think for anyone that is interested in an English or French, uh, you know, education, um, is a world-class value proposition. We have a million foreign students studying in Canada now. Uh, I think, um, you know, when you compare and contrast the cost of a foreign education, um, you know, in Canada, uh, costed in Canadian dollars, uh, when you compare and contrast to, say, U.S. dollars or euros, etc., cetera, um, it, it's very good value for money. We have a very strong, um, you know, educational ecosystem, whether it's for technical or vocational uh, studies, whether it's for elite academic institutions, we do have very world-class um, uh, uh, public education system. Um, post-secondary education system. So that's something that I think many Filipinos have come to appreciate. Plus the fact that when Filipinos come to Canada, they can actually work. You know, as part of our immigrant uh, visa, our student visa, uh, students can work. And uh, so that's also, I think, a, a, an, an additional, uh, you know, significant uh, value proposition, if you will, that I think is, is very enticing. And candidly, for those that are interested, it is also a pathway for permanent residency in Canada. And many Filipinos, frankly, have taken advantage of that opportunity. So, so next year is a big one. We're very excited, as I think you can tell. Uh, lots, of, um, lots of good things to look forward to. We'll have a capstone with leaders level visit. 
uh, to Canada. I think we're really looking forward to showcase uh, to the President uh, the very best of what we have to offer, the very best of Canadian hospitality, and I think for him to witness firsthand um, how fulsomely our two peoples are truly, truly integrated. You know, we talk today about all the things, the confluence of all of our like-minded interests, you know, uh, geoeconomic, geostrategic, etc. But I think what I'll leave last, and, I, and I've said this to many of you, I may have heard this, me uh, say this before, but, you know, all of those issues matter, you know, again, geopolitically, geostrategically, geoeconomically. But in the end, you know, very much of what happens here matters a great deal at a great many Canadians' dinner tables, right? So we have a familial relationship, and that's something very special, and it's something that we cherish, and it's something that we intend to continue to, to nurture and, and, and take care of. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to Ambassador David Hartman. Thank you. Thank you for saying yes to the to FSI's invitation for this inaugural lecture. So to close our event, may I call in front FSI's Assistant Secretary Francisco Noel R. Fernandez to award our simple token of appreciation to Ambassador Hartman, one Thank of you. FSI's publications, Dakilang Lagunense. Thank you. Again, thank you very much, Ambassador Hartman, for your presence and for sharing today. Thank you also to our gracious audience for listening and interacting actively with our lecturer. We hope to see you in the next sessions of Ambassador's Lecture Series. And we'd also like to invite everyone to partake of the simple refreshments outside of the library. So please they stay connected with us. The Foreign Service Institute has social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Visit our website for announcements of learning opportunities such as this. Visit www.fsi.gov.ph. See you next time and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much.